sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. And landowners just um, in regions will sometimes so uh, sometimes associate and um, work together on mineral issues. In Wyoming, we've got statewide uh, landowners associations and ranching associations, but there's also local associations. I think Commerce County, Wyoming, has one where they're circulating a standard service use agreement, and um, they share information so that the landowners aren't always at a disadvantage when the oil and gas company comes to lose. They don't say, oh, you say this is a producer's ADA, and this is what I get. That doesn't happen. And then industry, as a stakeholder, we typically think of the oil and gas companies, but um, one, there's a lot of variation in the oil and gas companies, and two, service companies are hugely impacted. Um, oil and gas companies vary from the majors, and the majors are the ones that have gas stations, BP, Marathon, ConocoPhillips, Chevron, um, used to be Texas Oil, they worked with Chevron, those are the really big, oh, Shell is one of those, the really big companies um, that have vertical integration down to the refining and delivery to the, to the consumer. And then you'll hear the term independence. They're the ones that don't have gas stations. Some of the big ones there are Anadarko, Devon, and Chesapeake. Um, I can't even keep track of all the ones that are in North Dakota. There's just tons of them developing all the time. And then there's a lot of variations in the um, approaches to legal issues, depending on whether or not the company is publicly traded versus privately held. And um, that's also, I also see a lot of difference in the way they approach leasing a lot of times. Um, the larger publicly traded companies a lot of times that focus starts being on the stock price. So they have to acquire a certain tract, certain block of land. Um, sometimes the, and they get so big that having exceptions is difficult for them to handle. So exceptions on your royalty provisions, exceptions on your um, consent to pooling and utilization or the few clauses, those are difficult for them to handle. Sometimes the smaller private companies that aren't publicly traded are a little bit more willing to work with landowners on those issues. The flip side of that is they don't have the capital resources necessarily all the time to adequately develop or develop as, um, as long, like down, down time on or a game store or whatever. And service companies are a really big player in the industry now because so much of oil and gas operations are really outsourced. So you've got drilling. Drilling companies um, are at the forefront of the whole fracking debate, Schlumberger, Halliburton, because they do that. The companies, Shell doesn't have drilling rigs. Chesapeake, they do actually have an oil field service company, but they are outsourcing all of those operations. And then they also outsource a lot of times their operating services. So the daily checking of the wells, um, that can be outsourced too. Then professional services, some of those are not in-house, but there's a lot of that outsourced as well, engineering, legal, um, that varies depending on the company. And like I said before, this is where I think you'll see the most impact from North Dakota is, or maybe there's the most opportunity for service companies to service that industry because there's just not enough bodies there to be able to cover everything they need. And then the other major stakeholder is government regulatory agencies. And in the materials, I don't know how this happened, but I left off local governments. But just starting from the top, uh, the federal government, in Wyoming, the BLM has a huge role because there's so many public lands, um, so many federally owned mills. So they have a huge impact on the regulatory direction, even at the state level. 
the Office of Natural Resources, that is the revenue collection arm, it used to be called the Minerals Management Service um, until they were involved in lots of scandals. And uh, the EPA, they play a role, but a lot of the environmental uh, programs are delegated to the states. But in Wyoming and in South Dakota, I'm sure this is true too, on tribal lands, EPA still controls the, the enforcement of the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, and that can be significant. And in Wyoming, we have a lot of development on the Wind River Reservation that's impacted by that. And then the Fish and Wildlife Service and their administration of the Endangered Species Act is significant. The, I put the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission next because it's not um, it's kind of a quasi government or it's a, uh, an association of state governments that develop the Model Act that um, interact to talk about the regulation of oil and gas operations and assist the state commissions on, um, in administering oil and gas regulatory programs. And their primary purposes of those commissions are protection of parole rights and conservation or preservation of waste. And that's the conservation in that context is primarily targeted at conservation of the resource. So, um, for example, in those old fields like Salt Creek in Wyoming and Spindletop in Texas, when they went and punched tons and tons of holes in the ground, they weren't necessarily um, doing the reservoir any good because they were pulling out those resources too fast and it damaged the geological structure underneath and the balance of those fluids in the reservoir. The oil and gas compact commission and the state oil and gas commissions have a lot of highly technical expertise, petroleum engineers and geologists, to make sure that development underground happening in a responsible way. And the other major thing that they um, regulate is well completions. And what you have to do to make sure that your well, when you drill it down in the ground, you are putting in the appropriate mechanisms, the steel pipe, the concrete, to protect the aquifers and the other geological formations that you're drilling through to get to the resource. Um, in South Dakota you're, and in North Dakota, a lot of the oil and gas commission regulation is combined with the environmental agencies. In Wyoming, we have a separate Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission and Department of Environmental Quality. And there is some flip-flopping, I'd say, of their jurisdiction, but generally they try not to both work on the same thing at the same time. The issue in Pavilion, Wyoming, is one of the one of the exceptions. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and then local governments have a role. In Wyoming, the state has preempted regulation of oil and gas, so local governments don't have a lot of authority to stop oil and gas or restrict oil and gas because that all goes through the oil and gas conservation division. <coughs> Excuse me, but. Through land use laws, um, things like conditional use permits, building permits, zoning, a lot of other local governments around the country serve a lot of uh, authority for oil and gas companies in the way they develop. And then environmental groups, I guess the government wasn't the last one. Like I said, that a lot of environmental groups have interaction with landowners and vice versa. <clears throat> the big thing with the involvement of environmental groups has always been standing and whether or not um, they have the, the um, skin in the game, they have something at risk, they have a, a right to be protected when they try to intervene in a, in a case or in an administrative Proceedings such as a rulemaking or a contested case, um, whether or not they have the authority to appeal a permit that's issued. And 
um, there's a wide variation in these environmental groups. There are national ones, and then there are local ones that pop up that respond to just particular issues. These are some examples of the environmental groups on a national scale. You've probably heard of most of these. Earth justice is basically the law firm for environmental groups. And in Wyoming, Biodiversity Conservation Alliance, it's kind of a statewide one, and so is Wyoming Outdoor Council. And some of these others are um, <clears throat> very site specific. Powder River Basin Resource Council was mostly focused on coal bed methane and Powder River Basin. There have been spin offs of that, which include the Clark Resource Council and the um, Million Area Concerned Citizens. That should be the word for Million Area Concerned Citizens. There's what's going on in that area. <coughs> I'm starting to lose my voice, so I'm going to try to go through this part fairly quickly. Um, because we've addressed a lot of this already in the discussion of the processes and the stakeholders. So mineral ownership, who owns the minerals, what kind they own, and what percentages. Um, in acquiring the lease, there are issues that can lead to litigation. Uh, as far as Max's discussion this morning of drafts was an interesting one to me because um, I've been in practice for about 10 years and I never saw a draft until a couple years ago. And they were largely had fallen off, but in this Niagara Shale play, in um, this, the uh, activity that's going on in eastern Wyoming and southeastern Wyoming, there are some companies that are using drafts again. And, um, it's also happening in northwestern Colorado, and I'm, <clears throat> my firm's based out of Denver, and I've done some work for Colorado landowners too, so I kind of follow what's going on there. Um, one company uh, issued drafts for a bunch of leases. I can't remember the number specifically, but it was over 100. They uh, issued drafts and then held on to the leases. Sometimes they actually recorded them, but they never honored the drafts. And then they came back and said, we're not, we're not going to take your lease. And in some circumstances, they had to file releases of the lease in the courthouse. But they held on to those leases for nine months while two other companies were trying to get leases in the area. And then they didn't pay for them. So that's a really significant issue for the mineral owners that we don't typically think about because they leased out their minerals to a company who didn't pay for it, but had all the appearance of having the right to have that lease, and that therefore interfered with their ability to lease anything else. So that was, there's a lot of lessons going on for that right now. And um, as far as did the right person execute the lease, this can be. This can come up with uh, corporations, LLCs, branch corporations, trusts. I have a case where there's my client is the trustee of a very major trust that was written in Illinois, and there's conflicting and ambiguous terms in there, and there's actually about 65 beneficiaries of that trust now. So we have to go back and try to get approval from all of them to rewrite the trust so that he has authority to issue that lease. And race notice issues. Um, at my former firm, right before I left, we actually had an issue come up where a landowner signed two leases. The first one was associated with the draft and it didn't get recorded. The second one, the company issued a check and went and recorded it. And when the first company went to record their lease, there was the other lease. <coughs> So, technically, the second company in Wyoming had the superior right because the first company didn't give notice, didn't get recorded, didn't give notice of their right. But the first company had an action against the landowner to recover the bonus, potentially for damages for not being the lease. 
When that's happening, the property is usually very lucrative. And so that's going to lead to litigation. Um, lease ownership, I'm not gonna go over a lot of this because it was covered um, quite a bit this morning, but determining who has the right to develop the lease, a lot of that happens through negotiations of joint operating agreements or pooling. Um, but there can be things that go on during the leasing portion, during the lease play, when um, the landmen are out there and what representations they make to get competitive advantages over the other companies. And the race notes issue is kind of an example of that. Uh, compliance with lease terms. There was a question about what do you do when a, when a company violates a service use agreement? What kind of protections do you have in there? Um, default provisions are really interesting. Indemnity and default provisions, a lot of lawyers I think look at those as boilerplate terms, but they're so important. And um, in the capacity of representing landowners, I've had um, quite a few disagreements with oil and gas operators as to what those default and uh, indemnity provisions should be. But I've seen um, the extremes from we can, uh, you can't kick us off the property, and this is in a mineral lease, so they actually, the mineral owner could actually conceivably kick them off because the mineral owner owns the minerals and the, the company doesn't have the right to develop those unless the mineral owner gives them the right. So the mineral owner or the mineral company proposes a default provision that says, um, if you think we're in, the, we're in default of the lease, you have to give us notice. So we can then have 60 days to cure. If we haven't cured by that time, your only remedy is to take us to court. Then we cannot be kicked off of this lease until <clears throat> after all appeals are exhausted and you've given us another 60 days after that to correct. So where does that stop? Because at that point, they've been ordered to do something and they still haven't done it take them to court again. Um, and it, by that time, it's several years, probably five years down the road. So you have to put up with it in that relationship for the entire time. I try to put in the provisions that say, you have a 30 day notice to cure. Um, there, uh, some sort of a provision in there for disagreements about whether or not there is breach. But if there's not a disagreement about a breach, Time to cure, if they're not cured, they're off. The lease is terminated. Or the landowner or the mineral owner has the right to determine what remedies they want to exercise, including an up to termination of the lease. Royalties, taxes, measurement, and custody transfer. <clears throat> this is where my accounting side comes in. And I find it very interesting, but I think I want to find it pretty boring. Um, there is Max talked about a lot of this this morning as far as how you measure royalties. Point evaluation, where you determine um, where you're going to say this is the value of the product and what costs are deductible from that value is, is huge. It's just as big as what the royalty rate is. Um, so in coal bed methane, I had a case where we were arguing with the state about point evaluation for tax purposes. And the tax, severance tax, which is a production tax, um, was supposed to be ter determined at the completion of production. The state wanted to push that point as far downstream as possible to get the value of the gas up. Because anything that's upstream is only the producer's responsibility and it's not deductible from the value. Anything that's downstream is deductible from the value. This is a hard concept to understand, but basically you've got the wellhead, you've got, you could have the point of sale of some of these larger companies, you could have the point of sale be the play, the entry to where the gas is getting odorized to go to the consumer. And that's definitely not the end of production. You've got all kinds of transportation in here that actually adds to the value of the gas. Um, so, that might be the only sales price that you have, but you deduct back transportation to the point where it's the end of production. And in um, 
In our case, it was uh, Williams Production Company. It, we went all the way to the Wyoming Supreme Court and still lost. But the question was gathering. And that's why gathering, I put that as a key term earlier, because gathering is taking it from individual wells to a common point of collection. And the state was saying gathering is a function of production. It's not a function of transportation. So we want to tax you here where you've collected it instead of here at the wellhead because it's so much more valuable here and we're not going to let you deduct this 20 cents per MCF cost um, off of the value of your production. That same thing comes up with royalty owners. In Wyoming, we've largely resolved a lot of that with the Wyoming Royalty Payment Act, but as new companies come into the state and try to put uh, in different lease terms, it's always a fight during leasing. Um, you also have a question from time to time about what are the products and the clause that says what's being leased. And sometimes leases actually define what's going to be considered natural gas is key. Um, federal natural gas leases actually do not lease helium. So a, an oil and gas company can't just take helium and pay a royalty on it. They actually have to give that helium to the federal government um, because it's not leased, but it comes up with the natural gas. And then flaring is often an issue with more and more um, now that gas prices are so low and it's not economic to transport a lot of natural gas to market, but gas is produced with the oil and sometimes even produce the oil. There's, it's very difficult to store natural gas anywhere unless there's a reservoir nearby. Um, so they have to burn it off and flare it. And we don't like that because it wastes resource and it's not good for the environment. <clears throat> and it deprives the state of the Um, split estate and surface use disputes basically talked about most of those issues, uh, talking about the landowners as stakeholders. Uh, many states have redefined what the surface use or the surface owners' rights are by statute. Uh, Wyoming has a surface split estate act, just like South Dakota does. Um, and then environmental regulations offer another layer of protection to landowners most of the time. Access is another issue that really has to be addressed in the surface uh, use agreements and what type of access the landowner is allowing, whether or not they're going to allow the surface to be used, their surface to be used to access other properties that the operator is operating on, and whether they're going to allow their surface to be used for unit ties development. It doesn't necessarily benefit the minerals that are directly under their land that's benefiting some other uh, minerals. So that's not uh, putting their surface serving into someone else's minerals. And then there's various levels of bonding that often do help protect the surface owner. In Wyoming, the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission requires a certain level of bonding from every operator. And if an operator goes under, the Oil and Gas Commission goes in and plugs their wells and makes sure, so that, makes sure that the reclamation is done. And the BLM has the same sort of requirements. Uh, indemnities and insurance, I talked a little bit about that. Uh, in leasing, it's usually a no-brainer. The Oil and Gas Company will identify the landowner and the mineral owner for whatever they do. Um, indemnities between companies get really complicated as far as joint operating agreements and the agreements between the, min the mineral leasing company or the operator and service companies. And a lot of master service agreements do put the onus on the consultant, the little guy, to indemnify and insure. And as a result of that, there's been a lot of anti-indemnity laws passed. Wyoming has one that says that you can't have an indemnity for your own negligence in anything associated with an oil, gas, or water well. And North Dakota was um, debating one of those, um, I think, in 2010. And I'm sure that, that will be an issue of possibly. 
Oh, and then CERCLA is always something to keep in mind. You can't identify yourself out of environment, federal environmental liability. And then you also have the common torts that you have in other situations. It's just that a lot of times there are more problems in oil and gas because it is a dangerous activity. Drilling is a dangerous activity. You're dealing with high pressure gas that's flammable, volatile, um, will, well, it's a natural product. It does come from the earth and it can cause environmental damage. Um, and towards very personal injuries on the drill site, uh, to people in the public. My former firm had a case where it was actually on the reservation and a, uh, one of the workers on the drill rig had, he was a problem because he kept sinking alcohol on the drill site. And he got drunk in, in his off hours, but he was at the, at the man camp near the facility. They tried to stop him, they took away his keys. They, um, I think that the drilling superintendent actually stood in front of his car to try to get him to not drive off. He had an extra set of keys. He drove off, got in an accident, killed someone. And 